Hello, Mayo, Florida. Can you hear us? All right. So we can take questions out of Florida. <laughs> Please come on down. For those that are in the back, you may need to, people may need to come in the middle. We will have some more uh, participants coming. I want to welcome everybody to our inaugural Walleye Tank event. This is our entrepreneurial event. Our goal is to build a community of entrepreneurs that are going to change the world. I think we have a fabulous lineup set up today. Um, we have three uh, junior uh, presentations uh, leading us off with and then 12 uh, companies and a series of service providers that we call bait shops, ready to help make this all happen. My vision is if you're in the front row, we have our walleyes in a minute, we have our presenters, and we have our audience. If you're in the audience, I want you to be thinking about whether, when, and wish you would be up here presenting or growing up and becoming a walleye. This is my excitement for, for my interpretation. I'm inspired by this, and I really thank you. This crowd is awesome. We are um, we are broadcasting to Mayo, Florida, because we will. The goal is to continue this um, long term. Maybe you have one of these in Florida coming up, um, and you're being recorded. Just letting you know for posterity. So um, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Ecker. I am a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology here at the Mayo Clinic. Um, this, this whole thing has been established with my partner in crime, Jamie Sundbeck. Jamie will tell a little bit about his story. And um, as, as people come on in, I want to do, I want to start by um, letting the walleyes introduce themselves. Um, and then we will get ready and get right to the, the pitches. Uh, Fernando, ready to take lead off? Sure. Hi. Fernando Bazan, I'm the uh, CTO of Biotechnic. That's a uh, biotech company in the Minneapolis uh, area. Um, my background's in uh, structural biology, biochemistry, biophysics. And my job, my day job, is to guide the science strategy of the company for the next, uh, not just next year, five or ten years down, down the road. Um, we recently started to get more involved with startups up at uh, the University of Minnesota. And I'm very glad to be here to sort of uh, look at the crop of uh, startups down here in Rochester. And uh, we pass it on. Hi, I'm Will. I'm co-founder of a startup called Opentron's Labworks. We make $3,000 open source liquid handling robots that let people just download a protocol and run as if they're downloading an experiment on an app store. Um, and we just most recently were part of Y Combinator and before that launched a Kickstarter and before that we're part of Hackcelerator. So we have been through a lot of sort of startup accelerator lean launchpad type things um, and I've been really excited to be engaging with the various startups here to help make these pitches um, and, and I'm really excited to see how they go forward. So happy to be here. I'm Perry Hackett. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota Center for Genome Engineering, Genetics and Cell Biology Development. And I've started two companies. You'll be hearing about both of them. Hello. My name is Luke Eisman. I'm the director of hardware at Y Combinator, where my main job is to convince people drastically smarter than me, like all of you, that it is drastically easier for them to build a company quickly than they think. My goal is to get you all to start companies and to launch faster than software companies do and to iterate more rapidly. Good afternoon, my name is Dan Estes. I'm Vice Chair of Mayo Clinic Ventures. As many of you may know, we're the tech commercialization arm of Mayo Clinic. Um, I uh, have served in that role for 11 years. I'm the non-science guy up here in front, or fellow non-science guy, so I'm a business guy. Um, I, as part of my role, uh, I help run the operations group uh, for Mayo Clinic Ventures as well as uh, external activities. I sit on the business advisory group for the University of Minnesota's tech commercialization group, their new ventures group that assesses technologies uh, eligible for spin out and start up. And I'm an officer on a Mayo Clinic spin out by the name of Resounded and uh, happy to be here. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Kelly Kranick. I am a business development manager in uh, the group that Dan just mentioned, Mayo Clinic Ventures. Um, pleased to be the only female uh, panelist on here. Uh, <laughs> my background is um, through, the, I started in the lab, so I understand a bit about, you know, clinical lab development as well as microarray expressions and, and that type of thing, but then quickly found that I was more interested in the business side of things. So in my role in business development, looking to partner Mayo Technologies with other outside entities, such as large companies, but including sm smart, uh, sorry, smaller startup companies as well. Um, and so I'm always interested in hearing what the latest, greatest thing is, and I'm looking forward to, being, uh, to hearing the pitches today. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to just for, for a couple seconds on format. So each of the main presentations will have five minutes. They've all been instructed, ideally, to focus on a two-minute type pitch and a lot of the three-minute questions of which the walleyes, and if we have time, we'll have grab from the audience. For the audience, you guys are also participants. The panelists will go through and we will select the top three presentations and you will select the winner and the second prize, runner-up for this presentation. That's why you have each been given a three-by-five card and a pen. Don't lose them, those are your votes. So um, as we come through, you should be paying attention. You can also use those note cards to take your own notes and pay attention to who you think is gonna be the better presenters. This is this process we wanna do is really build, it's all about community engagement. I want all of everybody to participate. Um, okay, any, any questions? So for the presenters, you will have, a, there'll be a five minute here, and the first two minutes will be green, and when the iPad goes yellow, you're beyond two minutes. And when it goes red or orange, um, in one minute, when it's red, I'm grabbing the microphone out of your hands. Okay, so um, are we set? Uh, you know, I can, is, are we set for the start? Because I, okay, we have an a, our, our first AV glitch. Come on down, Zachary, can we make sure we're set? Because we got booted by the Mayo Clinic Florida stream. It looks like it's still there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I want to I want to put the presentation up. Okay. Probably going to be over here. Those controls. Yep. I apologize. This was the one part we didn't uh, we weren't able to uh, technically uh, practice. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, as I said, these are our, our 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 process today. So, without further ado, because I really don't want to be standing, you want to be hearing all the wonderful uh, great stories today. Uh, Gene Coach, are you ready? Come on down. Hi everyone, my name is Paola and I'm here as part of Gene Coach. Could have the tech guy under the table. Yeah, the, right. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure will make it work. It's confusing. Cross for the better depth finder. There you go. <laughs> There we go. Hey, you got this. Take your time. Okay, again. Hi, my name is Paola Ramos, and I'm here as part of Jane Coach. How many people in this room have ever been on a diet? Well, you are among 45 million Americans that diet each year, spending more than $33 billion in weight loss products. Yet, two thirds of the Americans are obese or overweight. We believe one of the problems is that there are just so many options out there. The thing is that there is not a magic recipe for weight loss. Why? Because each of us is different. Your genetic makeup is different than mine, so whatever works for me might not work for you. Thankfully, technology has advanced tremendously, and we're able to look at your genes and make sure that the method that you're using is the one that is best for you. Yes, there's other companies out there, but don't let them fool you. They claim to be personalized, however, their recommendations are usually vague and premature. So that's what makes us different our deep understanding of the metabolic pathways at a genetic level. 
We are researchers at the Mayo Clinic where we have the resources and the knowledge that can get us to validate our system and stand out from the rest. So the process is very simple. All you have to do is go online, order your kit, send us your swab sample, let us do the sleep genotyping, get your results, and get coached. So you're not just going to get the results. We're going to be with you until you reach your goals. We're going to have a phone application where you'll be able to look at your results. This is just two of the genes. And also be able to track your meals, find recipes, get your exercise routine, and monitor your progress. So going back to the numbers, if 45 million Americans are on a diet each year, and you multiply that times the subscription fee, that's more than, that's almost $7 billion of potential market. We're here today because we believe in our company and we want your investment. And because it really doesn't matter if you're Sally, a mom of two kids that have to work full time, or you just Mike is trying to lose some pounds to impress the ladies. We're confident that Gene Coach will work for you. And we're really excited to be part of your weight loss journey until you reach the best version of yourself. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions? So how much does a kit cost and are there follow-up costs or is this just a single item uh, introduction? So that's what's going to make us a special. We're trying to get probably $150 at the beginning for the kit and for the first month of subscription. Then if you want to keep being coach, then it's going to be like another monthly fee. Are you looking to incorporate any uh, analysis of your microbiome, gut microbiome? Any, because that has a tremendous influence on your metabolism. In fact, they may regulate it. Yeah, definitely. Because um, the microbiome is going to tell how you're going to metabolize and how fast you're going to be able to use the nutrients. That's, that's a really good point. How much of a difference is there genetically? Like, is it that I should train dramatically different than someone with different genetic tests, or is it like a slight difference? Well, if you look at just one polymorphism, it might not be that different, but we're trying to do like parallel screening to have, you know, correlate a lot of the genes that we, we know that are crucial for your metabolism. So, I don't know, maybe one gene might have a 30% uh, allele frequency difference, but once you have all of it together, then we can, you know, just get the best method for you. Tell us about your uh, customer discovery process. How do you know people pay $150 for the kit plus a monthly fee? Who have you talked to and how many, how many potential customers have you uh, uh, spoken to about that? Well, first of all, myself, I've done this. I've tried uh, 23 and Me, but I'm, I don't really think it's very helpful. Also, we had customer interviews um, at the gym. They were really, really excited to, to try this out. Um, and just the statistical, um, you know, just looking at how many people, there's a lot of people that spend money trying to, you know, look, get fit and look better. How many SNPs do you think you're going to have to look for or test to get to a meaningful, you know, individualized program? Yeah, well, right now we're looking just at weight loss. We might have to look. We're trying to decrease the number just to get the really important ones so that to decrease the, the price. But we probably might look first like around 30 SNPs. Um, and then from there, depending on what you want, then the analysis will get larger. When will I be able to order this? Well, first we're trying to probably start like a pilot uh, where we're going to ask the people who has already done the analysis probably and uh, with other companies. So just get help them get coached. So we're going to start with that. And then once we start doing the probably in, in a year, we might be able to. Thank you. Great, love the questions, love the answers. Okay, for Janetta Pure, please come on down. And we'll, we'll have the presenters use the lapel mic so that we can use the wand we have. Hand off. We're okay with one, please. We're okay with that one. Okay, so Perfect. I think they can. Okay. Oh, that was the other option. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay
director, just yep, keep doing that. Yeah, just don't worry about the little fellows. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. <clears throat> Hi. I'm Jake from Jeanette Pure, and we're making a healthier alternative to the miniature horse. Cute, right? <laughs> Miniatures today suffer from a number of hereditary health problems. If you own an animal with one of these disorders, you can expect to spend in excess of $12,000 in extra veterinary costs over the lifetime of your pet. Recent equine genetic literature has pointed to a number of genetic locations that control for size. We believe that by finding healthy, normal horses and genetically editing their offspring, we can create what we call the micro horse. And today, we're asking for $100,000 to make the first one. We've evaluated the unhealthy miniature horse market and put the value at $28 million. But we expect, with the introduction of the, mini the micro horse, to put an, a zero on top of that number. But that's not all. This technology will enable us to tackle a number of health problems throughout the companion animal world. Years ago, when the equine world exploded in, population, in popularity, a number of top stallions would produce over a thousand foals in their lifetime. <clears throat> Turns out some of these successful studs carry genetic disease. And today, in the Belgian draft, at least 90% of the population carries a harmful meta metabolic disorder. In 2009, the Kennel Club expected a third of all dogs to develop a serious health condition by age five. Imagine instead if all dogs were to live a long, healthy life to old age. With Jeanette Pure, this may someday be a reality. What this company represents is the opportunity for a new platform for improved companion animal health, starting with the micro horse. I am a, as a member of the Genome Writers Guild, I am immersed and trained in one of the world's best genome engineering communities. My company will have insider's access to improvement of our core technology as it becomes cheaper and easier to use. I've also reached out to a number of our top health, animal health institutions, and with their strategic partnerships, we can begin to improve our animals in parallel as the understanding of how animal health genetics informs animal health outcomes. I'm Jake from Jeanette Pure, and if you want to talk about how we're going to make the next generation of healthier pets, you can talk to me after the presentations today or email me. Thank you very much. Hi, Jake. Hi. So I'm just curious why you chose the micro horse as your first project. Great question. So of all the horse breeds, the miniature horse probably suffers the worst from these genetic problems. It's a result of selective breeding for their size. And a lot of times, the breeding practices involve inbreeding. So you see a lot of um, what would be normally rare genetic disease being really prevalent. Two-part question, Jake. Uh, the, the existing market is $28 million. What's the math on that? Where does that come from? So I observed the popular, from, I took a survey from the uh, American Horse Association. They did a survey a few years back and estimated the miniature horse population in America. I, extracted, I extrapolated from an average cost of the miniature horse to that number of population in, in the United States. I assume you're going to be genome editing or engineering to do this, and if you're doing it by breeding, how long does it take to get to your goal? So I expect, at least to make the first horse, that it'll take two years. A minimum one year for gestation, and then a year to bring all the elements together, including the services I'll need for the technique. Could you go into a little more detail about what your technique is? So. Well, I didn't mention this, but this approach wouldn't have been possible a few years back, and that's because of some of the advances we made in um, animal reproductive biology and understanding <coughs> that. There are a number of in vitro fertilization techniques and understanding how, the, um, how we can get uh, a number of fertilized embryos that, to make this financially possible. Also, the fact that this occurred in China in dogs already last year was a big indicator that this was possible in other animals as well. I, I mean, I've heard of micro pigs. And, uh, have you guys learned anything from how folks are trying to break that market open and yep. how well uh, adopted uh, they're becoming? So the micro pig sort of informed um, the original idea for the micro horse. Um, as you can see by that similar uh, nomenclature, but um, I haven't done my homework on how they're trying to break into the market. But from the customer interviews I've done. The sheer cuteness factor alone is really overwhelming some people. <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I think there's gonna, definitely going to be a sell, obviously, as it's a new product. But I think it's, it's not, a, not a very cool battle. And only half joking, is a, a nano horse not far away? <laughs> <laughs> Chihuahua well, we, can, we can keep it on the table for now. have a duo presentation here. And they get extra kudos because they help make the all of the AV system work at the beginning for everybody wanted in this room. So thank you very much. Ready? Hi, my name is Alec Kolila and I'm a PhD student here at Mayo Clinic and I've dedicated the last three years to studying genetic hearing loss. And my name is Panos Teorazoudis and I'm a doctor and a researcher working at the Neurosurgery Department. Today we're going to talk to you about our first product, Go Audio. According to the Hearing Loss Association of America, about 20% of Americans have reported some degree of hearing loss. That means that one in five people in this room will develop hearing loss in their lifetime, but won't know it because they don't get regular hearing screenings. In addition, a 2011 analysis showed that approximately two-thirds of primary care physicians do not include a hearing training test in the annual physical. Go Audio is an easy-to-use and accurate technology that brings better hearing screening and more efficient health visits. Our device uses noise-canceling headphones that are coupled to an easy-to-use iPod application that measures the hearing thresholds. Using Go Audio, a patient can come in for their yearly physical exam and have their hearing tested, just like their blood pressure. Or they can purchase it on the App Store and use it at their convenience. What makes our product unique is that we're using noise-canceling headphones that mimic the soundproof room in which normally a hearing test is conducted. Currently, we have two major departments, family practice, family medicine, and pediatrics that are interested in utilizing our technology. Incorporating Go Audio in the Mayo Clinic clinical practice would further bolster our product because patients know and trust Mayo Clinic to always provide the best health care for their patients. And with Go Audio, we'll be providing hearing screening services to anyone and everyone just by using a simple app. And remember, this is just the start in our suite of digital health apps. So which of you will join our team as strategic partners and upgrade our medical technology to something easy to use, portable, and accessible? Thank you. Do you guys, do you guys address uh, a tinnitus? Tinnitus? Right. Yeah, so that's um, something separate, usually that affects the hearing test in general. So um, we currently, our product will not address tinnitus, but that could be something that we, we address uh, in the future. So do you know how big your potential market is for these hearing tests? Yeah, so there's a huge market for this because A, um, in rural areas especially, audiological services are not always available. So that's a huge market for this because people need to get their hearing tested. Additionally, there's um, a specific uh, chemotherapy drug that's used on patients, and this drug causes hearing loss. And physicians actually don't know at what point in the dosing does this cause hearing loss. And so we spoke to a medical oncologist that's actually very interested in implementing this because he would be able to track his patient's hearing across time. And once he sees any small indication of hearing loss, he can switch to another chemotherapy drug that's not traditionally used initially because it's more expensive. Who will pay for this? It's a good question. So we're currently targeting large institutions, for instance, like Mayo Clinic or other hospitals, that would be able to purchase the noise canceling headphones and the app to use it in their um, family practice or pediatrics. So right now we're thinking that it would be the um, institution or we could possibly talk to insurance companies about covering this. And then what would their incentive be to pay for this, you know, given the current environment of, you know, cost cutting measures that are needed to be implemented? So right now we believe that this will really bring access to hearing loss screening because just thinking about what an audiologist or audiological service would cost to bring more in just to provide this annual screening, this would actually save money for a hospital rather than having to bring in multiple audiological specialists. Why not start selling this now in the App Store? Advice only, not a diagnosis for like $5 per download. So that's a really interest. Uh, we're pretty sure uh, 
our device, so we're working with our regulatory specialists here. Uh, we do know that our device is not significant risk, so we can move forward with FDA approval and all the you know, impediments very quickly. Uh, and I think we also got an IV approval, uh, so that can make our uh, application you know, in the App Store really strong and different from all the others out there. Uh, I don't know, I'll, uh, if those want to. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we talked earlier today about how you guys are making it so you can just download a professional grade, you know, hearing <coughs> test and, and run it on yourself. And so I, I think that your market is much, much bigger than, you know, clinics. And, and so I think that you really need to think about your go to market strategy because you have the advantage of uh, having an app store that's out there that has billion of people connected to it, and some of them are going to want to test their hearing. Um, so I think that your app can stand out in a busy app store because you are Mayo Clinic researchers and you are experts at this and you do have IRB approval. But I think that that should not make you shy away from the mass market. It should make you embrace it and it will make you succeed in it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Come on down. You're the next contestant. <laughs> oh, we get set up. Wasn't weren't those junior anglers awesome? Just... Yeah. Anytime you're ready. Move it up. Say something. Oh, make sure it's on. Hold it up to yes. your mouth once you say something. Oh. Yeah, it's not on. Give him the regular mic. Just go with this. We're too, we're too complicated. Uh, tried and true. Tried and true. Hello. Uh, there you go. Hey, everyone. My name is Carl, and I'm a co founder of Slate Q. We're an online marketplace where scientists can buy and sell research writing skills from other scientists. Imagine the Airbnb of research writing skills. So I've been in scientific research for eight years, and as a graduate student trying to write multiple papers at the same time, I wanted expert feedback on my writing style and syntax. So I looked around at author services companies, and I was pretty dissatisfied. Not only was it impossible to be matched up with somebody who knew anything about my field, but the prices were anywhere from steep to ridiculous, upwards of a thousand bucks a paper. And a lot of other scientists have been in the same boat. In 2015 alone, 7.4 million non-native English-speaking scientific researchers pumped out one and a half million research papers. And the majority of those research papers are targeted towards high impact, target journals that are published in US or UK English, like you can, see, you can see on the right. Now, that means that most researchers globally encounter a language barrier when they're trying to publish their work. And in order to help them get over that barrier, the author services market exists. And this is a half a billion dollar industry in the United States every year. Unfortunately, as with my experience, the lack of depth of knowledge and the high cost results in a failure to meet the needs of active scientists trying to publish in highly technical fields. We never needed full-time teams of scientific writers who don't know the first thing about the research papers that they're trying to edit. What we needed was a marketplace where active scientists could sell their research skills to other active scientists. So my co-founders and I created Slate Q. We're redesigning the delivery of author services by employing a distributed economy model. We allow, give our customers their choice of editors. We only allow active scientists to edit papers. And all of the interactions between clients are hosted online and in real time. By doing this, we're able to beat our competitors' costs by one half to one tenth. Not to mention the legitimate expertise that we're able to deliver to all of our customers. We're Slate Q, and we're the marketplace for writing and editing skills. Our mission is to push science forward 
by helping great researchers become more published and more read. If you're interested, come find me after the talk. Thank you. Have you launched yet? So we have a beta site that's active right now. We have uh, 40 editors or so. We're kind of limited in our online capabilities, but we're out there. How do you get paid? So we're charging right now a flat rate of four cents a word. And as we are pulling in editors and we'll be building out our online capabilities, that'll be prorated based on the editor's previous customer ratings. And that will incentivize editors to do a good job and also increase our revenue. So could you just talk a little bit more about your traction? How many papers have been published through this platform and stuff like that? We haven't done any yet. Um, we have a lot of editors that are really interested and we just started trying to target major R1 universities and hoping to get in touch with our customer bases. So what's your plan for finding those customers? Um, right now, going to uh, vendor fairs and uh, trying to market in scientific journals. I, yeah. Why don't you just put up some AdWords campaigns or targeted Facebook tomorrow for people Googling or searching for help writing thesis? Yeah, that's, that's something we've talked about a lot, um, but I don't know, people suck it online marketing campaigns, I guess, so we're not, we're not too confident that's the right strategy. Do you vet your editors at all? How are they We do, yeah. Okay. So, the process? Yeah, so in order to be an editor, you have to either hold a doctorate degree, you have to have a publication that's in, you have to have your name on a publication that's in a citable and uh, peer-reviewed journal, and, or you have to be an upper-level student uh, in a doctoral program. So, why limit the editors to only be active scientists? I mean, that's kind of hard to sometimes nail down. And also, another uh, fertile area for, for targeting is our grants, grant writing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've gotten that comment a lot about grants, uh, and it's something that we're really interested in expanding into. Um, the reason that we want to have active scientists is because the goal is to, to match you as a customer with somebody who is current in the scientific literature and kind of knows how the papers are being published and where they're going and how they're being written. So that kind of fluency is really the expertise they're trying to deliver. We have uh, Oryx Sciences next. Hi, my name is Luke Hepner, and I'm one of the co-founders of Rx Sciences. We have developed a nanotech-based skin therapy solution. As you can see from my pale complexion, I burn easily. <laughs> this was about 10 years ago. I went on a trip to Hawaii, and I went snorkeling. I even remembered to apply sunscreen, but I was alone, and I couldn't apply it to my back myself. About an hour or two later, I got done snorkeling, felt sick and had a blistering sunburn on my back that was quite severe. Severe enough, the whole nine hour plane ride home, I was like this, because I couldn't lean back. So, if we had developed um, Afterburn technology about 10 years ago, this would have really helped me. So, um, Afterburn is a topical cream that can be applied post-sunburn to relieve the painful and red um, effects of sunburn. Shown here is the effects of afterburn in sunburned mouse skin. So at RX Sciences, we have developed a nanotech drug delivery platform that can be applied to a variety of skin health issues. A variety of business opportunities exist in the skincare field. So each year, Americans spend over $6 billion for psoriasis um, treatments that are ineffective. They spend over $2 billion on ageless skin, and radiation dermatitis results in over a billion dollars spent each year by Americans. We aim to enter these markets as well as the skin care prevention and sunburn markets, which are newer than the first three, and we hope to 
first pursue radiation dermatitis, which is similar from sunburn. It results from um, burns that occur um, when patients are being treated with radiation therapy for cancer. We have assembled a team of world-class skin researchers, and last summer we went through the Lean Launchpad startup program to iterate our idea and gain um, to iterate our idea and develop market research on the skin solutions that we have developed. We aim to be in clinical trials by the end of this year, and we're excited about this opportunity to gain business partnerships and investment opportunities. Please talk to any members of our team afterwards if you're interested and want to learn more. Thank you. Hi, Luke. Hi, Dan. Good to see you again. You too. As a fellow redhead, I'm certainly interested in your technology. <laughs> um, since your Launchpad experience, uh, tell this uh, group a little bit about uh, um, defining what the cost of your product is mm -hmm. and uh, how the market might react to that cost. So um, I think one of the greatest challenges in the cost of our product is scaling so that we can make this um, large enough so that we can market it. Um, some of the progress we've made in the past year is um, doing additional um, experiments in model systems as well as um, gaining IRB approval for the radiation dermatitis experiments in humans. In a 10 second nutshell, what exactly is the mechanism of action of the compound that's in Afterburn? So we're using nanotechnology to improve the delivery and activity of molecular targeted therapies to the skin. But do, do you come up with those therapies or are you only the delivery vehicle? We come up with those therapies as well. So like our platform technology is the delivery vehicle, but we're also doing research on these technologies. So like, of course, like we're iterating, iterating based on the technologies that exist or the therapies that exist, but we believe that, and our data has shown that we can vastly improve the delivery and activity of these therapies. In theory, you, you could approach big companies with your vehicle and say, we, we can deliver your material better than... Right, exactly. We can go to them and say, we can make what you do better. And, and that relates a bit to my question. So is Afterburn the same exact formulation for um, sunburn as it is for uh, dermatitis, radiation dermatitis, and, and for the other indications as well, or is each one its own uh, product that would need a separate approval process? So sunburn is similar enough to radiation dermatitis that the formulation would be similar if not identical. In terms of like psoriasis and other diseases like that, it would be a different molecular targeted therapy. Why not start selling immediately $100 for a tiny tube anti-aging thing that actually works unlike all of the other ones and requires no clearance. So that's something we've thought about. We felt like with radiation dermatitis it would be easier to do the clinical trial first and we could be charging $500 and it would be covered by a patient's deductible that's already been met. Okay. Um, Genome Collective, we actually don't have your talk. Can you, can you get it down? Um, Alan, can you, for Legion, can we just do a swap and we get uh, Genome Collectives loaded? Alan, are you ready? All right. So this is Legion. Well, or not. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to go first? Yeah. yeah I, I'm not right. you're, on, you're on deck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hi, my name is Stephen Hart. I'm the Associate Director for Bioinformatics in the Clinical Genome Sequencing Lab and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Health Sciences Research. Hi, this is Asif Hussain. I'm a unit manager at Mayo Clinic, and we are the Genome Collective. We also have Travis here. All right, raise your hand if you have ever used Google, Facebook, or Twitter. Yeah, that's what we expected, and we have some bad news for you. You have been ripped off. Every day, these companies collect your personal information and sell it at a premium without you, the consumer, even knowing about this. And guess what? You know, so most of this information is probably you think benign. You know, you're 
Google searches, your Facebook shares, and your shopping habits. But the same exact thing happens with research and clinical data. These companies do the exact same thing. You send in your you know, material with some of your information, they run some experiments, and turn around and sell your personal information at a premium to third party companies. And what gets us really fired up is now these companies are actually sharing any of this profit with you, the consumer. I mean, if you think about it, you know, it's your data, you're putting in the time and effort to building this collection. And that's why we built the Genome Collective, a medical data brokerage firm specializing in genomics and electronic healthcare record data surveys. We believe that the data belongs to the participant, you, and not some monolithic institution. And if people are buying data for a premium, shouldn't you be able to sell it? We think so, and we want to facilitate that relationship. So what does that actually mean if the data is yours? Well, if you can sell the data at a cost smaller than what it takes to actually generate it, you can make a profit. And if you want to think about it in terms of genetic sequencing, in our genetics lab, we have single gene tests that cost on, on the order of $4,000 a piece for maybe one gene. We can do the entire genome at a fraction of that. Plus, we also give you the opportunity to navigate through your genome itself and find out other interesting facets that you otherwise would not have been able to recognize, like your ancestry or other clinically re relevant pieces of information that may not have been available otherwise. We actually want to do this because we want to empower you, the participants, the consumers, to actually drive forward the field of personalized medicine. So hopefully together we can stop ripping each other off and start working together collectively. Thank you. So why should I care that people are selling my personal information as long as the service is anonymizing it and still providing enough value to me for me to continue using it? That's a, that's a very nice way of saying I have enough money and I don't need any more. But I can tell you, especially for the target market that we really want to go after, which are minorities and underrepresented populations, that is not a, an option that they want to explore. I mean, I remember when I was in college, I was donating plasma to make money a couple of times a week. So, so is I this like I make I sell my information for thousands of dollars, or you know, this doesn't seem like very valuable information. Uh, actually, our platform not only monetizes it; it gives you another option. It gives you the control. So, you know, you may not need the money, and you may want to donate it, but you probably still want to see how your data is being used. You know. Right now, it's a black hole. When the data goes in, you have no idea how this data is being used. You know, let's say, for example, you know, you, you were a patient and your you know, data was collected. Maybe you know, this data is being re used for your research. Maybe you want to donate the data that you get from the company for that research cause. And our platform would enable you to do that as well. So if I'm a customer, tell me how this works. I sign up for your service. You. I pay you to sequence my genome. How does it explain? So there's a couple of entry points here. So one entry point is the consumer-driven genetics app like 23andMe, where we send you a kit, you send information, maybe a little bit of money to help offset the cost of doing the whole genome sequencing. We put your data in the system, and we give you access to the website. Then consumers or the, the companies will actually come in and try and buy different cohorts. And so they'll have to submit an IRB-approved protocol that says, this is what I want to do with your data. Do you agree or disagree? If you agree, then I'll cut you a check. The other way of doing it is to partner with uh, genetic sequencing providers, kind of like MML, ARUB, some of these other clinical genetic testing services, because if we can start sequencing these and selling the data to these sequences uh, for an entire genome at less than the cost of a single gene panel that we're doing here, well, then I don't see how you wouldn't do that. Are these potential buyers of this data already getting the milk for free? A lot of times they do get it for free. Uh, so if you think about the, the government repository dbGaP, so anytime you're using NIH-funded money for genetic studies, you're supposed to deposit your information in there. However, they deposit the very minimal information so that you don't get as much value out of it, and that's what we want to change. So just in follow-up to my question, so you've got somebody who's got an IRB-approved protocol comes in for a specific cohort, then you're then giving some of that revenue that they've paid the, 
the genome collected back to the participants in the cohort? That's right. They get a percentage of revenue based off every time their data gets sold, it goes into the queue, and every year they get a dividend based on the number of sales that that particular individual has contributed to. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Okay, Lei Jin. I feel like I've been here before. <laughs> Okay, I'm Alan Malmerstein. I'm a professor at Mayo Clinic. I'm also the founder of Lagia Laboratories. Uh, we are a Minnesota-based LLC, and we've been around now for about a year. Uh, damage to the retinal pigment epithelium causes vision loss in 3 million Americans and over 30 million people worldwide. It occurs through a combination of genetic causes and drug toxicity. Pharma generates $10 billion a year in drugs to treat only 10% of the people who have these problems, which means that 90% of people who suffer from RPE damage currently are unaddressed. And the reason that that's unaddressed is we need better models to deal with this. Um, the reason we need better models is this is the model that exists today. We have two different cell lines that have been long established, but these cell lines don't work very well. They don't have the properties of the RPE cells that are being damaged in these disease states. In fact, they're so bad that the top ophthalmology journals have recently decided to no longer accept papers using these cell lines. Legend's product looks like an RPE cell, smells like an RPE cell, tastes like an RPE cell. So you can imagine it must be an RPE cell. You can see it has pigment, and RPE means retinal pigment epithelium. They also form cobblestone or hexagonal like monolayers of epithelia, which these other lines don't do. And maybe most importantly, biochemically, they express the right protein markers, which the other cell lines don't. <coughs> Legion Laboratories makes these cells available off the shelves. They're derived from induced pluripotent stem cells, and so not only can we make them from one line, but we can make them to express the entire array of human genetic diversity as well as disease. What's the market? We went and tested this market at the Association for Research and Vision and Ophthalmology back in May. We had a booth there where we talked to uh, attendees at the meeting. There are over 11,000 from academic, clinical, and industrial vision science. What we found was that the com the, a wide variety of companies were interested in our product. These included Genentech, Novartis, Regeneron, Sanofi. The cost of our product on a unit basis, which would be $750 to $1,100, was well tolerated by the people we spoke to. Um, academic lab heads indicated that they would use between one and two units a month or 12 to 24 per year and pharmaceutical companies indicated that if they were interested in our product they would buy between 5 and 30 for assay development and up to a thousand units for drug screens. The result of this is that we predict annual sales to academic researchers at half a million a year and to pharma of well over three million dollars a year. What's our competition? There isn't any. Although there are other companies like Axol, CDI, and Applied Stem Cell Technologies that currently sell IPS or induced pluripotent stem cell derived cells, none of them sell RPE and in fact none of them sell cell types that are from the eye, which is our niche. Uh, our other competition, of course, would include researchers and companies doing it themselves. There are very few and of course the accepted cell lines are dropping out of favor. So what's the risk? Not much. Our business model, we're bootstrapping it. We've already generated between a seed round and loans enough money to build a production facility and we're ready to make sales. We even have inventory. Market timing, perfect. Nobody else is making IPS RPE and the journals don't want to publish the cell lines that exist. Everybody's hungry for an alternative. Market size, we need one-tenth. That's one-tenth of the U.S. market to be profitable. Anything more than that? Uh, <laughs> icing on the cake. Financially speaking, we've been through the seed round, like I said, and we have licenses or will shortly with everybody we need to have future IP. But where do we go from here? It's a single cell type. Well, like CDI, which is a hundred plus million dollar company, Legion Laboratories is going to expand its line of offerings. We're not only going to offer additional cell types, though, but all of the materials you need to support that. That includes tissue culture media, antibodies, and kits for specific assays, and we'll provide custom assistance to pharmaceutical companies who are looking to develop new drug screens. Last, we're interested in entering the cell therapy market. Our production line will allow us to set up the GMP line we need to get into cell therapy, and these cells are already being tested for treatment of dry AMD. Questions? If, if you're ready to make sales, why are you not making sales? Dotting I's and crossing T's on a couple of license agreements.
That that sounds like a red flag for giant IP issues that are not resolved. I won't go there, but it, it's not as what it sounds like. So if the technology's out there, would that one risk be that somebody else just up and makes their own IPSC RPE cells and competes with you? How hard would that be? It takes a long time and a lot of work to do it. One of the things that we've done is optimize for commercial scaling, which nobody else really has done. Um, uh, my knowledge of what's going on in this field is the reason it hasn't entered the marketplace is our proprietary technology that allows us to scale growth of the cells commercially where others don't. Is, is this more of an, an art and, and not kind of protected? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. People standing near the back, you can go ahead and find a seat up here. There are seats if you want to come down. Next up, we have Ambient Clinical Analytics. All right. Technical issue, but I'll work through it. Uh, I'm Al Burning, CEO of Ambient Clinical Analytics, and uh, we, we've licensed uh, over a thousand rules and algorithms from the Mayo Clinic that run the ICUs, emergency departments, and other critical care areas, and they provide clinical decision support tools across those areas. Uh, we've been in business about two years, and it's great to see the uh, um, enthusiasm for entrepreneurship. This is my fourth company. And uh, 15 years ago when we started, there were two or three groups in Rochester, now there's dozens, so, so it's uh, fantastic to see. Um, the the uh, tools that we provide are, are in, in place to uh, quickly assimilate the data and uh, allow the uh, clinicians to put the data into a form that's usable for them. And the, uh, the, the key of it in this partial slide is that uh, It'll, it'll allow the clinicians to uh, address what's going on with that particular patient and then make it a, a quick decision and treat that decision. And as an example, we're in most EMR and data record systems, a clinician will have to click 18 to 20 times to uh, get to that particular decision. In this case, they see it immediately when it, when it presents itself to that particular, uh, to, to that particular clinician. The uh, business model is our, our uh, tools are sold on a per bed, per month basis. We're, we're a SaaS model, and it ranges from $400 per bed for the flagship product to $50 per bed for the uh, sepsis product. And it's, we're, we're currently uh, in, in uh, uh, shipment mode post FDA clearance because, because we are detecting uh, conditions and alerting clinicians to it makes it a class two medical device. So we went through 510K clearance last year got the release and started ramping up the uh, sales process. Uh, it, a, a best example to talk about, and given the slide uh, deck here, I'll just uh, focus on sepsis as the uh, key indicator. Se sepsis is, is uh, an easy uh, condition to talk about because every, every hospital in the U.S. is uh, working to improve their sepsis treatment protocol. It costs the U.S. over $20 billion a year through CMS to uh, treat sepsis. And in the case of uh, just you know, seeing the news just in the last several months, Patty Duke, some of you remember, died of sepsis. Uh, uh, Muhammad Ali had a lot of medical conditions, but he specifically died of sepsis. 25% of the people that get sepsis die from sepsis. And it's a, it is the second most costly condition. So the, the tool that the male clinicians develop searches all the electronic medical, medical record data and then we'll provide an alert when the conditions for sepsis exist. And then the second step will be, it'll kick into an immediate four-hour timestamp protocol. And the requirement for that, for that particular protocol is to make sure that those steps, which include antibiotics, additional fluids, are done in that, in that four-hour period. If they are, the patient has the best chance of not only surviving, but uh, has the best chance of not having any other, any other medical damage from, from sepsis. So from a business model standpoint, we, we see this market as a uh, plus $2 billion market, and that's correlating against it for, uh, performance management uh, tools that are used in other industries. And that's one of, the, one of the beauties 
of this particular tool. It's very similar to what was used in technology industries and financial industries for de detecting conditions and getting them out there and fixing them. And it's the same thing that we're doing now. And it's only it's late to the medical industry, but it's not too late. So it's, it's fun to be in that process. We, we are in a, a currently in a 1.5 million offering round. We raised 2 million last year to get through the FDA clearance process. And uh, we're ramping from here. So questions? So what does your sales process look like? Is it an enterprise type big? It's, it's an enterprise sale. The, the tool bolts on to the electronic medical record system. We're agnostic. It could be a Cerner system, Epic system, a Kesson system. And we, we have a small direct sales team. And then we've also partnered with some, some large resellers, Philips, Lido, uh, Brandex locally. So we've got a, a combination model. And uh, Philips announced at the uh, HIMSS electronic medical show uh, uh, last month, they had 88 million hits on the website for the press release. So Philips is out there in full force uh, worldwide, and uh, the others are ramping up as well. So when do you start selling, and do you have predictions for how many you'll sell in the first? Our, year? our, our objective is to sell 10 to 15 systems this year. Philips has sold the first system. It's, there's an average ARR per system of 10,000, so we need eight to 10 to get to break even. Uh, we we have we're in the planning process with our direct team for uh, for two sales. And then we have 30 proposals out there that we expect to close three to five more within the next two months. So you're just starting to sell now, and you have not closed any sales yet, correct? But Phillips has closed a sale, and then we, we have two verbals that we're in the process of doing the planning for. And what's the value of the sale you closed? The, the Phillips sale, we're estimating at 125000 ARR. Of, of the proposals we have in place, they're all between uh, 25 to 150 per year, average of uh, 100. Thanks. Thank you. Life Is this one working? Okay. Hi, I'm Jared Campbell, co-founder of Life Engine, and we make kits to make gene editing super simple. Gene editing is cellular programming, and its products are being used to, to tackle some of the most difficult challenges our world faces. Dairy cattle are typically born with horns, and at an early age, those, those horns um, are sawed off. Scientists have figured out a way to use, uh, to use gene editing to make dairy cattle that are actually born without their horns. By doing this, they eliminate an incredibly inhumane process, and, it's going to, and products like these are going to change the world. But it's not just food and agriculture. How about cancer? Leukemias are actually being cured using gene editing. You can take a cell from a patient do gene editing on that cell, put that cell back in the patient, and it will go and find cancer, and it will kill that cancer cell. Not only that, but gene editing is currently undergoing a Moore's Law-like exponential growth. For the past, every, or since 2011, every two years, the, the cost per edit has dropped almost tenfold, and our team is at the leading edge of this Moore's Law of gene editing. Right now, it doesn't cost millions of dollars to have access to this breakthrough technology. We sell a kit that, uh, for $3,000 that will build you 40, com over 40 completely customizable gene editing tools. Not only that, but we're seven times faster and 10 times cheaper than our competitor. And we have built in the option of immediately scaling genome engineering or genome or gene editing by uh, by allowing you to use this robot on personalized lab automation platforms. We have sold two kits to date, including one to Recombinetics, who built the hornless dairy cattle, and they're already using this system to simplify their own gene editing. Forty-eight billion dollars. That's how much, in 2015, life scientists spent on reagents and tools. And this is the market that we're in. 
I'm Jared from Life Engine, and we build kits to simplify gene editing. If you'd like to talk to me or any of the Life Engine team, feel free to shoot us an email or stop us at any time. Thank you. Questions? Forty-eight billion dollar, forty-eight billion dollar market estimate. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, what percentage do you want to grab, and how long to get there? <laughs> um, so there is, a, I mean, that's a, a big market that includes all research and um, development. And the reason it's so high is because pharmaceuticals is actually starting to reinvest in research and development, um, where before they were doing a lot of acquisitions and hoping that would work moving forward. But a lot of internal research and development is happening now. And one of their primary interests is in gene editing. So I would say this is a growing market in inside this gigant, gigantic market. Um, I don't have figures to, to um, to talk about how big it could become, but Moore's law, like exponential growth in fields, fundamentally changes how things are done, and we think this technology is going to change the world. How many reagent kits are you going to sell this year? So we sold two so far, <laughs> and we will sell ten kits this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, per okay. month, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> per month, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, right now we're in the process of ramping production and ramping sales. So over the next six months, our focus is going to be on sales. Uh, we're also um, in the process of building another product that complements this one that will actually add to additional sales. Um, and we have a research and development team um, also investing in a, in a fairly similar product that will also be available by early 2017. So we'll have pre, three products available early next year. Um, but yeah. <laughs> you, you haven't identified the platform, but uh, how difficult was it to get freedom to operate licenses? Uh, we are just selling it. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, we built a system in-house and that system we own, and we are making it available to everybody else. It's time. Yeah, it's time. Oh. <laughs> Micrometer, you're up. Stop it. Licensing consultants. <laughs> Licensing <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Knights. I'm here with Micrometer Genomics, where we do superior microbiome profiling. This is your gut. It is the equivalent of a jungle with literally trillions of bacterial cells, approximately 10 or almost 10 bacterial cells per human cell in your body, around 100 bacterial genes for every human gene, and somewhere around 1,000 bacterial species living in your gut. Um, this is called your microbiome. This is your gut on drugs, specifically antibiotics, but there are many other ways that your gut community can get disrupted. And there's been a lot of amazing research over the last decade into what this means for you when your gut becomes imbalanced. Turns out that an imbalance in your microbiome is linked to every disease on this slide, many of which have been rising to epidemic proportions globally since the invention of antibiotics. Um, this has uh, garnered a lot of attention in the popular press. You've probably read about it. Um, but I want to ask you a question. Raise your hand if you've ever taken a poop. I'm just kidding. Uh, so, uh, so it turns out that all of this research is done by sequencing bacterial DNA from poop. And what many people don't know is that underneath the hood, the methods for measuring this DNA are very inaccurate. So this is a slide, uh, a plot of the current best practices 
it's a mock uh, bacterial community where the blue bars should all be along that dotted line. And you can see that it's highly inaccurate. On this log scale, uh, some of those species are almost completely dropping out. Now, this becomes a real problem if you're trying to do clinical R&D because as more and more of the species are almost completely missed, then you could be potentially missing important therapeutic targets. <coughs> At Micrometer Genomics, we generate the most accurate and rigorous microbiome data. Uh, we have a new method that solves the dropout problem, and that's coming out of Nature Biotech soon, uh, which is the top biotech journal in the world. Then we also have IP that allows us to quantify and correct for the residual errors. Why this market? This market is literally growing like this. This is a plot of the publications that mention the word microbiome uh, over the last decade. We also already do this in a local academic market under the uh, direction of Kenny Beckman, one of the founders. The University of Minnesota Genomics Center has generated, in the last year, around $600,000 of revenue just for microbiome sequencing, just in the local academic market. Of course, our target market is much larger, which is the clinical research market. Uh, this market includes basically every major pharmaceutical company, all of whom are putting tens or hundreds of millions of dollars into microbiome research. Uh, and in addition, the White House just announced a, a microbiome initiative and recognized the, the university for being a leader in that field. So these are our customers. They will send us samples as part of their research studies. We will apply our methods to them, return the data through the cloud, uh, at which point they can interact with it and know that they're getting quality controlled, quality assured, clinical grade data. <coughs> our team is Kenny Beckman, he's the director of the Genomics Center. Uh, Daryl Gold is the research lead there. And myself, uh, I'm an assistant professor in computer science and biotechnology at the university. These guys do the wet lab work. Um, I've seen a lot of people try to solve these problems over the last 10 years, and they fix the dropout problem in 12 months. My lab does precise annotation on the informatics side. We're Micrometer Genomics. We're very excited about this opportunity, and we'd love to talk to you if you're interested in partnering or investing. Hi. So um, I'm a little bit familiar with a lot of the microbiome companies um, in my role at Mayo. And I know that some of those companies that you've listed there live and breathe by the proprietary discovery platforms that they've developed in-house. So have you talked to those groups about their openness to outsourcing at least a portion yes. of that? Yes. Uh, actually, we have been talking with a number of those companies, uh, and I, I'm on the advisory board for a couple of them. And they, they do outsource their data generation. And in fact, they're very concerned about having high quality data because they are specifically looking for therapeutic targets. So uh, just because they generate the data through us doesn't mean that they have to reveal the important metadata that says, you know, these are the controls, these are the treatment groups, and so on. When will you launch? Um, well, we, we are basically ready to go. We just need funding to scale up, and uh, sometime within the next six months, we should be ready to um, start accepting samples. Can you just accept fewer samples with less funding now? Um, well, we, so we could probably be ready to go within a few months. We just got space and we're still in the process of, um, you know, determining the uh, funding models that we're going after. Stephen Jane, you're up. Hi there, how's everybody doing? You holding up? So I'm Jeff Flyer. I'm with Bemogen Biotechnologies. Um, I'm gonna just real quickly, which way to go to the right? So classic uh, forward-looking statement. So who are we and what do we do? We're a genome editing company, a gene editing company. Today that market is estimated to be at $3.9 billion. Um, there's a couple of major players out there called Horizon Discovery and Transposigen. We have a, a book of services and products that are very similar to those. That's not the primary purpose of our organization, though. Um, what we do is we have four key developments that are currently underway that we think are going to be game changers in this industry. Later on in the presentation, I'm going to talk about two of them because that's all the only time we have. So we just recently completed our Series A financing. We've, we're about 97% filled as of this afternoon. We got another investor. And we will be, if two of the four 
developments that we have underway really pan out, we will be going to a Series B in the first quarter of 2017. We've been market facing since about February. We've booked $150,000 of business. We have customers like Gilead Sciences, Harvard Medical, Biogenetic. So we're on our way. So we break our business into three buckets. We currently do offer these products and services. It is just gene editing services that go. Um, we're currently actively delivering on those. Then we also have collaborative researches where we take our proprietary technology and we work with our customers to kind of embed them into their particular products. We have a relationship with Biotechni that we're doing that today. Um, on the third kind of bucket of our business is where we're really doing innovations and development, of which I'd like to tell you about two of them today. So in the gene delivery, especially if you look at the CAR T-cell world that has taken off just like um, rocket fires in the last kind of six to ten months, they use lentiviral vectors to do their gene modification. And currently there's some big challenges around that. They're expensive to make. Um, the supply of those lentiviral vectors is inconsistent, so therefore clinical trials have stopped. Um, we believe we have some methods that are going to allow us to do non-viral gene delivery in efficiency rates that are equal to or better than the lentiviral vectors. Um, it'll be much reduced cost for them to manufacture and eventually it'll be product consistency will be significantly improved. So this is one of our big developments. we are got proof points that the track we're on is working and we hope to deliver this kind of to the marketplace in the latter part of 2016. The other area that we're working very hard on is we've got an exclusive license with Mayo in mitochondria DNA editing. So we will be the first company to go out and do mitochondria DNA editing into the commercial marketplace. There's proven work that it works in uh, fish. We have now doing work to kind of make this mechanism work in humans. So we think there's a multitude of applications there from diseases and therapeutic applications to also reference standards that we can put into labs that do mitochondria um, analytics. So this is our team. It's based out of the University of Minnesota, some of the founders of the team that are science, that are well known in this particular space. So again, I'm Jeff Leiter. Um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody in regards to what we're doing after this uh, day is over. Questions? Yeah, so sorry if I missed it, but are you selling like gene editing as a service? Yes, so it's both products and services. So we can sell kits and the reagents, but then we also will take people's cell lines and gene modify them. And Got knock ins it. or knockouts. Okay, and what, how do those two business models play together? So the products, reagents, we're going to sell over the web, as you might guess, and try and minimize our amount of effort there on the services. It's a direct enterprise sell where we're talking to those customers and average range of those are $10,000 to $20,000 depending on the complexity. I'm curious what your plan is on taking on Xiafarm that uses Sleeping Beauty transposons for CAR T cell therapy and has of course a $27 billion company that's in back of it. Yeah, great question. And we basically have two very underdeveloped transposons that have not been commercialized or exploited in the marketplace anywhere today. We've got freedom to operate. We're working on that. We've got our filing our patents on them in about a week and a half. So that's how we plan on doing it. Great. Thank you. Quick, are you ready? All right. Hi, I'm Rataza Laktawala, co-founder of Beltwigs. Uh, we are the next generation of conception. The reality is today our families are waiting until later to start having kids. As a result, one in five women have trouble right now getting pregnant. Solutions exist, but are extremely limited. You have pregnancy tests, ovulation tests, disposable tests, reusable tests, finding microscopes, and there are websites that help you interpret those tests, and then you have to manually enter all this data into peer trackers. 
Clearly, it's overwhelming. It's a huge part of your life. Even after spending hundreds of dollars on trying such uh, products, the result is a feeling of frustration and lost time. Annually, just in the United States, families are spending over $5 billion on fertility products and services. And that's where we come in. Wealthwix is a mobile platform that uses a combination of hardware sensors and app-based algorithms to help women take control of their health, starting with helping them conceive. We are a Bluetooth-enabled modular medical device that fits in the palm of your hand and can measure two key fertility parameters. The first sensor, LabTwig, measures fertility hormones from urine and predicts ovulation. By the way, it can also confirm pregnancy. The second sensor, ThermoTwig, measures basal body temperature from under the tongue to, to confirm ovulation. The data from the sensors are transferred to the app using a Bluetooth connection. Then the sensor data is analyzed by cloud-based algorithms, which predict the best time to conceive. By the way, these algorithms were developed under the guide of uh, reproductive health at Mayo Clinic. Uh, we are the most comprehensive solution in the market that can measure fertility hormones from urine. We are the only smartphone-based solution that can accurately me measure fertility hormones and predict ovulation. Uh, we have made tremendous progress so far and are on a fast track for a 2017 power college. The vision of Beltwitz is to be a comprehensive tool for women's health using our app, our sensors, and our future sensors. We want to help women from the time they are trying to conceive all the way post-pregnancy. And this is the team that's going to bring the vision to market. We have expertise in medical devices, software applications, and women's health. So uh, if you're an investor, uh, we'd love your help in bringing this part to market. We are also looking for a marketing lead if you have a background in consumer, uh, consumer products. Thank you. Uh, does this product have any regulatory requirements to go to market? Yes. Uh, so our product falls in the uh, FDA class two exempt category. Uh, it needs to be manufactured and designed for FDA's requirements, but doesn't need uh, 510K approval. 510K? Does not need. Not need. So why not launch a pre-sales campaign like tomorrow? Yes, we are working towards that. Right now, we are running a cons consumption study where women are using it in, the, in a home setting. We are gathering all the feedback and to uh, develop the final design of the product. So you buy the hardware separately and then kits of individual strips, or, or what does that look like? Right. So the business model, app is available for free. The kit with two sensors and three months supply of consumables will be sold direct to consumer. And then additional test strips will be available uh, as an add-on. Are you developing additional sensors that can plug in more tools, I guess? Or are you going to open that up so others can? Right. So right now, that's the idea. That's uh, the idea behind the modular device, where we want to uh, introduce different sensors uh, that can be attached to our module base uh, in, for other women's health applications. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Scott McIver. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota, but I'm also um, chief development officer at Amisoft, a company based in um, Seattle. Just a little bit of uh, history on this. Okay, so in 2000, Steve Ecker, Perry Hack, and Dave Largespot and I launched Discovery Genomics in part to commercialize the um, Sleep and Beauty Transposon system. In um, um, March of this year, DGI was acquired by Amisoft Corporation. And uh, it was an asset acquisition. I was one of the assets, so I now work for Immusoft. Okay, so what does Immusoft do? Uh, the, Immusoft works on genetically engineered B cells as a way of producing proteins.
for therapy as a cellular therapy. Then there are, I, the rationale is that B cells are a professional protein producing uh, cell population. So the idea is that the um, cells are taken from a patient, the B cells are purified, and then electroporated with a, uh, a transposon encoding a therapeutic protein, expanded in culture, and then reintroduced into the patient to produce that protein and treat the disease. The first disease that's on, uh, on deck to be treated is called MPS1. It's a rare um, uh, lysosomal storage disease. That's the other local connection. University of Minnesota is a world center for the treatment of this, this disease by enzyme replacement therapy and by hematopoietic stem cell transplants. So the patients are available for us to try new therapies out. <coughs> Uh, this is the IP situation. It was developed on IP that uh, came from Caltech in David Baltimore's lab in terms of the B cell genetic engineering. It's been uh, expanded upon at Immusoft. The asset acquisition agreement included a, uh, an exclusive license to use the sleep beauty transposon system for MPS1 and an exclusive option to license for hemophilia A and B, which is essentially all of hemophilia, and uh, also for other lysosomal diseases. This is the team that includes people locally uh, in Minnesota, including myself, the team in Seattle, and our CEO, Matt Schultz. <clears throat> uh, the company has so far raised $6 million uh, from some rather prominent investors and is currently seeking $20 million in Series B funding to support the launching of this first Phase one clinical trial and expand this into a second clinical trial. This is a phase one clinical trial for a trio to MPS1 uh, to uh, address safety and efficacy. And then um, uh, this shows the uh, inclusion correct. And then the idea ultimately then is to expand from this rare disease, markets limited, probably 800 million, to uh, a more common but uh, uh, larger market, maybe 6 billion for the hemophilias and then uh, ultimately go into much uh, larger markets here. So that's, that's Immusoft, that's what we work on, that's what we're looking for. If you'd like to know more, you can uh, visit us at immusoft.com or you can ask me now. Thank you. Your clinical development plan <clears throat> is nicely defined there. How many years till your uh, projecting revenue and how much expense to get there? Oh, well, so in order to get revenue, you'd have to go through phase one, phase two, you have to go through, yeah, so uh, I would say five years. Five years? Yeah. How much money? How much are you going to spend? I mean, oh. What would you expect you'd spend to, to go through those five years? Oh, it's, it, that's going to have to go to, you know, hundreds, hundreds of millions, yes. Yep. And yes. that's just for the one um, MSP1 product. How far behind are the others? Oh, um, we're following on rather uh, rapidly. We've already have some of the, um, the, the uh, initial expression data for um, hemophilia and for uh, some, from some other enzymes as well. Any questions? All right. Well, thanks, Guy. Uh, thank you. So um, thanks for being here. I'm Kawai Peng, and I am a co-founder and chief operating officer of Humanist Life Sciences and professor of oncology at Mayo. So I own equity in the company, and so Mayo and myself have a financial interest in it. So um, Humanist Life Sciences is one of the first Mayo EEP program founded four years ago, and we are headquartered at the Bio Business Center. We're on the ground level, and there we have built our research labs as well as manufacturing labs to support our business model. So what do we do? We provide products, services to support the emerging fields of regenerative medicine, virus therapy, gene therapy, and cellular therapy. You heard of many, many therapies presented here today. 
Many of them are in regenerative medicine and stem cell technologies. You know it's an expanding field. We feel we came in at the right time because there is an unmet need. Well, we all develop innovative therapies, but very often we do not know where they go. We put it in large animal models, small animal models, and eventually in humans. You're essentially putting your cell therapies or gene therapies in a black hole if they are not monitored. So what Imanis does is to provide a reporter gene technology, products and services to support all your research needs in these following areas. Here you see an animal that is rotating with high resolution imaging that we could observe. That's a AAV gene transfer. And then that is the sleeping beauty gene delivery to the liver, as well as the virus, measles virus spread within the tumor. You can clearly see the durability of your gene expression. Where has your therapies gone? And importantly, you no longer have to harvest those animals at various time points. And this is especially critical when, into, when you move into large animal models such as this at Mayo Clinic in a study performed by Maggie Redfield and Steve Russell. Here's an image of the heart of an animal, a dog in this instance, where we have given the AAV gene transfer and it can clearly show you the durability of gene expression, the location, and whether you have achieved enough gene expression levels. <coughs> so over these four years, we have built an extensive product list. We hope that you'll be able to incorporate all these technologies into your research because it will empower you in your drug development as well as research. We have over 200 products. I have brought our product line, and this is cell lines. <laughs> We sell luciferase reporter cell lines for half the cost of our major competitor. So why wouldn't you buy from us? Thank you very much. Hi. How, how many sales have you had? Or what was your, what's your revenue to date? Um, we have actually um, had a million dollars in revenue last year. We have doubled from the previous year, so we are on target. We already have sold more products this year than the whole of last year. So we are on target to double our revenue from last year. We also have been very successful in obtaining NIH SBI grants. That's a fantastic way to, in order to develop our R&D, and we have been developing the next generation of reporter genes. And, and what outlet are you using to, to sell your products, and how do you get the word out? That is actually a, one of our major brain uh, uh, headaches, because the, we had a sales rep at the beginning, and in the end, what we realized, and it's a learn, learning process, after six months, he did not make a single sale. We pay him a base salary and a commission. And in, what we ended up doing is go, go to trade shows, go to the correct trade shows, pay about few thousand dollars for a booth and actually word of mouth and sending out um, flyers as well as doing webinars. What's your profit margin on that million in revenue? You know, that's a very good question. It comes from various sources, so the different, they have different profit margins and I can discuss in detail with you at a, another, in another platform. Overall, approximately. Um, I'd rather not discuss that. Can companies approach you with uh, a certain experiment in mind and you can configure the assay for it? Is that a typical service that you would run? Yeah, we can. So uh, very often, Howie has um, a lot of these, um, how you say, clients come to us. They will say, I would like to ask where my sales have gone or I'd like to have, I have this idea. Um, the most recent one was that I would like to protect my IP using an oncolytic virus. Can you design from concept? So what we have to have, and that is some of the problem I am facing, is the growth. Is As a service, you need your high-caliber um, scientists. You have a good team. Team building is critically important, and that is one of the headaches I have. So we design for you all the vectors. We perform the in-life imaging for you to whatever degree you prefer. And we have been having great partners with the Mayo Clinic to enable us to do some of these studies. So I've asked one of our walleyes to do double duty. 
I was a little disappointed to hear that you didn't bring one of your demonstration products, but apparently it doesn't fit in your car. Is that how it works? All right, Perry, this is Perry with uh, Recombinetics. Thank you very much, Steve. And, and thank you all for coming. Uh, you can see from this slide that uh, I don't always obey uh, the suggestions, but what this slide is meant to represent is that I've spent the past 15 years, 16 years now of my life, taking model systems to human benefit. So we all know that the CRISPR-Cas technology has taken over everybody's imagination for genome editing, but let's not forget that in the 21st century, the real efficient genome editing was introduced by Dan Voitas around 2010 from the Center of Genome Engineering. My dad, that Steve Ecker was the first head of the Beckman Center that uh, preceded the Center for Genome Engineering. The big questions are, what do you do with it? The old-fashioned genetic engineering was just the equivalent of adding an expression cassette to a genome. That's like adding a sentence to a book. In today's world, though, we talk about genome editing precision, changing one character in a thousand books. That's what we do. Anything can be written. Minnesota, we have to realize, is the focus for genetic editing applications in agriculture. I'd like to describe them. So I'm representing Recombinetics now, both as a co-founder and a member of the board, a former chief science officer. On this slide, you see on the left that genome editing on large animals can be applied to, in fact, large-scale agriculture. At the very bottom, you see that starvation is beginning to increase worldwide. The World Food Organization estimates we'll have to double the food supply by 2050 to accommodate everybody in 2050 with adequate nutrition. We have a choice of either greatly expanding the efficiency of agriculture or, of course, going into lands that we'd otherwise like to keep pristine. In the middle is represented the ability of genetically editing animals to more reasonably recapitulate human diseases and disorders, and we do that mainly in pigs, and that's our lead-off models, as you'll see. A third area is to grow human organs in pig avatars. I won't be talking about that. That's about 20 years down the road. What I would like to show you, though, is, and you've seen uh, the picture of Burry and Spotted G in the upper right-hand corner already, thank you, uh, that Acelogen, which is our division for genome editing of agricultural animals, is very robust. Down at the bottom, you can see our double-muscled uh, cows that we've produced. Any lines that you see that go beyond that uh, second vertical line represent animals on the ground. Others are on the ground, but in testing and being validated. We have any number of other animals that are in our freezers ready to be made when we find partners for their development. Surgeon is our animal model system, and that's a far more robust area where we're already making sales. You can see our uh, pig for metabolic syndrome in the upper right. We have an atherosclerosis model pig. You can see a little bit of his disorder. We have a model for um, cardiomyopathy. And then down below, a pig that represents polycystic kidney disease. The little red oval represents the size of a normal kidney. The dotted line indicates the kidney in this particular model animal. We have a number of cancer pigs that also have been made. So the bottom line is that we're unprecedented, really, in the biotech world. As you can see, we have a unique focus. Everybody else seems to be using site-specific mutagenesis for human uh, health issues. We're taking everything between the two coasts uh, and applying it to agriculture. We have total freedom to operate. We have controlling IP, including IP on the use of CRISPR technology in uh, livestock. We have extensive product pipeline you saw, income revenue. We've got the right people. And you can be a part of this revolution. Our B round is nearly complete. It, we've got $5 a share. We're looking for $10 million of financing that we believe will close by July 31st. Thank you.
sorry, two questions. Um, how much uh, revenue have you generated over what period of time? And then what would the use of the funds be for this round? Yes, we've raised $18 million in, in sales of stock and another $10 million in research grants and contracts. And what will you use the additional funding for? We need to expand our facilities to have complete freedom to do our business without uh, having to use other vendors for reproductive technologies and the like. Do you think there's any regulatory risk around selling like the dead end, the pre-castrated cattle? Do you think you'll ever feel any pressure from anyone to do freestanding? Like this is so beneficial to hunger that these animals should be able to reproduce? So that's one of the most important questions is what do you do about regulations? And what we've done is to take various reports that point out that what we do is not considered genetic modifications via recombinant DNA. Our position is that we have grass status that's generally regarded as safe. What we do is no different than using an expedited system that could come from just mating of animals. So we don't report to the FDA and we've let them know and they haven't said a word back. Great, thanks, Terry. Okay, while we, um, this is gonna be a, a slight intermission, the walleyes, you have your charge. Carl will take you up. You are charged to deliberate. Come back with us with a list of three recommendations for potential winners and runner-up, and one potential junior angler. Okay, so the last part, while they let our esteemed guests deliberate. Um, we have been joined by the last segment, which is um, a set of local um, entrepreneurs whose voices represent um, help. So what do I mean by that? I believe that building a startup is like raising a child. It's a, it takes a village to make a startup go. And these are all services that are being designed and built and for those especially that are, may not be here, the Destination Medical Center is a dramatic um, investment in this the capacity to make and grow. So Jamie, one of our, our event co-organizers, is off on a new adventure and we're going to hear about it now. Thanks, Jamie. Oh, you want the microphone? <laughs> Cut me off. Um, Okay, so first of all, we've been here a really long time, so everybody stand up and stretch for like two seconds. Because I get like, I don't have to face the walleyes, so stretch. I needed to. All right, second of all, I am so glad I didn't wear Steve Ecker's jacket because I have one exactly like it, and I was just about to wear that today. So. Stoked about that. Um... Well, we're all getting uh, settled here. I'd also, um, so I poke fun at Steve, but I want to I thank Steve for, uh, and his team for really pulling all of this together. Uh, as, he, as Steve mentioned, I am uh, as leaving Mayo in, in 20 days, I think almost exactly, and uh, embarking on a new adventure, which I'll talk about today. So can we have a round of applause for Steve and his group? because I was pretty moderately useless the last couple of days. <laughs> I was wrapping up some stuff. So I'm going to try to record this, too, because that's the way I am. Um, Reset. Slides. Slides are there, trust me. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Sunsbach, and I want to share with you an exciting new entrepreneurial resource in Rochester that we're calling Collider. So Collider is both a an organization and a physical location to accelerate the Rochester entrepreneurial community. First and foremost, Collider is a community organization that builds on the work that we've started with BioAM. 
which is a local community organization focused on creating a life science entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Rochester. And after about 200 events over the course of three years, I noticed that about 50% of the people that showed up to BioAM weren't really interested in life science entrepreneurship, but they were interested in other avenues of entrepreneurship like social, tech, food, and service-based entrepreneurship. So Collider will help address this gap in our community by being inclusive of all entrepreneurs in the region. Collider will support the, the random collisions that we need to help our emerging entrepreneurial ecosystem grow. Not just for existing entrepreneurs, but for all the entrepreneurs to come within the next 20 years as we think about things like Destination Medical Center. Collider is also a physical location, however, that we're calling Collider Core. Located in the historic Conley Mass Building in Rochester's Discovery Square District, Collider Core will offer space that's perfect for solo entrepreneurs all the way up to small teams. Collider Core will also aid entrepreneurs by leveraging the resources of the community in Rochester, as well as several other communities that we have contacts in, to really remove the barriers to success and, and make uh, your enterprise successful. Collider and Collider Core will launch in a little over a month. I'm sweating about that. And I can't wait to work with all of you as we work together to create the entrepreneurial community that will literally change the location and face of Rochester. So here's uh, my contact info, and I'd love to talk to you more after the event. Thanks. Thanks, JV. Up next is, uh, our, is Techstars. Hi, my name is Rochelle Rubio, and I'm the program director of Techstars Plus um, Plus. So Techstars is a global ecosystem that empowers entrepreneurs to bring new technologies to market wherever they choose to do business. Here in Minnesota, we're doing a number of things. Um, as you can see, there's Startup Weekend, which some of you might be familiar with, or Startup Digest, because they, we have it here in Rochester. <laughs> it's because he co-organized, that's why. Um, we also have Startup Weekends all over Minnesota, Iowa. We've, we've done them in over 2,000 locations across the globe, so I'm happy to say that we have that here. We have Startup Week, if any of you have been up to the Twin Cities and seen that, we've been running those for about seven years now. Um, Startup Next, we are launching that with Lando Lakes uh, that was just recently announced, and that's gonna be around food and agriculture. And then we have a retail accelerator that actually just launched last Monday um, in the Twin Cities, and that's with Target. And then you have my program, which is Techstars Plus Plus. So Techstars Plus Plus is a collaboration between Techstars and Mayo Clinic. It's a business development program with the aim of leveraging innovative technology to improve patient care. Now, it's not just about getting new technologies into Mayo and improving patient care, and there has to be some sort of benefit to all of us. So we try to provide connections, not just for our founders and for the physicians and clinicians here, but for the community as well. And we're doing that through different types of events. Uh, last week, a lot of you might have been to the DMC Mayo Clinic co-hosted event that we had over at UMR, uh, where we had Troy Hennikoff talk about Chicago and how they were able to create a tech ecosystem there. We've also brought in Techstars co-founder David Brown and numerous other managing directors, and we'll actually be doing the same thing next month. Uh, and we even even have some wonderful kids who have been interns in our program uh, this past program that we ran last week, we had 11 interns, and they're all in high school, guys. Uh, and what's the impact here? So we partner with a lot of 
programs here in town, DMC, Journey to Growth. Um, we were integral in TEDx Dunbar River. Uh, I mentor at Technovation, BDPA, and we're hoping that as this continued partnership progresses, that we're able to find more opportunities to connect with our community and grow the entrepreneurial ecosystem here. Um, these are some pictures of the startup weekend. I want to tell you a little bit more about this because I'd like to have another one of these um, maybe next year here in Rochester, focused on not just youth, but for the entire community as well. Uh, in this program, in a 54-hour time frame, you go from an idea on a Friday night to a Shark Tank style pitch on the Sunday, which is basically like what you saw all this, this afternoon. Uh, we also work with Girl Scouts. We raised over $2,000 for them um, with that Repel, the U.S. Bank building, if you remember that. And if you have any uh, questions about entrepreneurship, you might want to read a couple of these books. Um, I would start up with Startup Communities. Uh, it's a great book by Brad Fell that talks about Boulder and how they got started. And it's very comparable to our world here in Rochester. But if you have any questions or just want to chat, um, get some feedback about you know what you're doing with your startup. Feel free to contact me. It's my card. Thanks, Michelle. All right, Savior, you ready? Do we time you and everything too? Uh -huh. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Xavi Frigola, and I'm a former researcher like many of you, but for the last three years I've been helping the local startups in the Mayo Clinic Business Accelerator. The Mayo Clinic Business Accelerator is located in the second floor of the Minnesota Bio Business Center, and our goal is to help the local community by helping the local startups. Uh, to that end, the Accelerator acts as a business incubator 45 weeks of the year, we have space, we, have link, uh, net, we organize networking events, uh, we have links to local service providers, and we have connections to funding sources. Uh, four to five weeks out of the year, we act as a business accelerator, and we host outside companies to Rochester. They come and partner to Mayo Clinic, and that's in combination with Techstars and Mayo Clinic Ventures. <coughs> There are currently 22 companies in the accelerator, and three of them have graduated, expanded operations, and remained in our community. Uh, there, uh, a service to the community, our service to the community is reflected in the number of jobs created by those companies, and a testament to their health is the number of dollars that they've raised, that they use to hire more people and grow. Uh, we organize one to two entrepreneurial events. Those are open to the, all the community to attend, all culminated with an entrepreneurial gala at the end of November on the last day of Global Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, and we are open to the community, as you can see in the slide. Uh, we host local educational uh, groups and cohorts. We, there are many planning events that have, and the space is being used by many planning events like Rochelle was mentioning, the, our uh, first TEDx Summer River and uh, our first own startup weekend for high school kids were, were organized on the accelerator by the community. Uh, if you want to participate, I would encourage you to start by joining the mailing, the mailing list and attend one of our events. And if you want to talk, my information is on the slide. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Jordan Miller. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Surgery. And so how many people in here have ever had an idea for a device or a technology that they really thought would be, you know, important and good, right, you know, in the medical practice or elsewhere? How many people actually knew exactly what to do with it or where to go with it or how to get funding for it the moment that you had that idea? Right. And especially if you're in Mayo, you know, I mean, usually you know, the, the best thing to do is just is to pound your head on the counter sometimes, you know, and you just hope that the idea just goes away, you know, because the process is pretty frustrating, right? Anybody who's ever done that really knows that's the truth, right? So for us, in the Department of Surgery, what we did is we established an infrastructure uh, for the, that's, the, that's called the Innovation Accelerator. 
And so what is the Innovation Accelerator? So we're, uh, we're actually rapidly expanding infrastructure uh, that, that focuses on two major, major things. One is rapid device prototyping. And the second is the facilitation of partner formation, both inside and outside the institution, for commercialization of ideas that individuals have uh, within uh, Mayo Clinic. And so with regards to uh, rapid device prototyping, you know, we really have one fundamental goal, and, and, and that is to, to develop a minimum viable product to go from idea to tangible product in 12 weeks. Right, and uh, and so what most people come in with is they say, hey, you know, this is this is what I really want, right? You know, this is my minimum viable product. And we say, that's that's funny, you know, that's that's great, uh, you know, that's like 250k at the very minimum just to even get part of the way there, um, you, you know. And a lot of times you go somewhere else and they'll say, well, this is what we'll give you for a pretty sizable chunk of money, right? And you say, well, I'm not gonna, okay, I can't pitch that to anybody, right? So what we do is we sort of end up somewhere in the middle where we get you something that'll get you from point A to point B and you can actually take back, it's tangible, it's testable, it's usable, right? But then you can use that to pitch other, other uh, people to, to really move that device forward and, and get it out of the institution and really get it into the practice. So you say, well, you know, it, it, can you actually do that inside a 12-week period? Because anybody who's ever tried to generate a device uh, you know, say that's, that's pretty challenging if it's a technically oriented device. And so we actually uh, generated seven uh, devices in uh, 2015 uh, with seven different investigators. And currently we have nine additional projects underway in 2016. And so we don't have time to talk to you about this today, but if you want to uh, uh, you know, discuss any of those, I can connect you with these people or, uh, or we can talk about it offline. And so I think for us, our, our selection criteria, you know, is really, it's fundamentally based around the importance of the problem, right? You know, so uh, it, it, it's, it's patient impact and not necessarily population size, you know. And so anybody who says, well, you know, that population is, is really too small, I would say, well, you know, in Mayo, the, the tip of the pyramid is also the smallest part. So if you really want to have an impact, uh, you know, it, it, that's, that's one significant, or most significant criteria for project selection. Uh, all of the projects are peer reviewed, uh, so if for surgical products, you know, they're re reviewed by surgeons, for clinical products, they're re reviewed by clinicians, so on and so forth. Um, feasibility, if we can't get it done in 12 weeks, you know, we're going to shoot you pretty straight on that one. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, it's commercial potential, right? You know, so that's really our, sort of our, our final discerning uh, point, not really out of the gate. Um, and so you can say, well, that sounds pretty good to be true, too good to be true, uh, and nobody can really be a one-stop shop for everything, right? You know, we've done catheter-based technologies, we've done tools, devices, so on and so forth, and I'm not going to lie to you, we're, we're really not. Uh, what we do is we take your idea, we shop it around institutional resources, you know, we've got the classic alphabet soup here of, of OTP and uh, MCV and uh, BM, PBME and so on and so forth. But we also, importantly, we take it outside of the institution as well to trusted contract research organizations that can do things a lot faster than we can internally a lot of times to the specialization of the companies. And so, so with that, you know, that really allows us to operate in, in a unique space and move things along very quickly to minimum viable prototype. Um, now, in terms of partnership facilitation, we have a, sort of an inside-in uh, approach where we connect people working on similar technologies together to get uh, functional uh, innovation groups. And, uh, and then we also work uh, inside out and outside in, really. So, uh, you know, we, we connect investigators to companies and startups. We've worked with uh, Rochelle to try and connect Techstars people to uh, internal investigators who can provide some insights. And uh, we'd be happy to work with Twin Cities-based companies as well to try and, uh, and build the community here. Uh, and of course, it, it, if Kelly or anybody else from MCV is watching, you know, they would say, well, we appreciate knowing that we do try to work with know-how agreements when appropriate. So, so collectively, you'd say, well, you know, why should you contact the Innovation Accelerator with your idea? Or if you're a small company, you know, why should you get a hold of either myself or Jamie? You know, because we would argue that, that no patient at Mayo Clinic should actually have to wait for a better solution. And so uh, with that, you know, uh, we'd be happy to connect with anybody afterwards. Thank you. Jordan. Yeah. So, um, as an insider, how is the IP protected when you talk to the outside contractors? So, so we have all of our uh, outside contractors uh, uh, sign a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, we do everything we can up front to ensure that 
uh, everything is is protected at least from uh, to the extent we can with intellectual property. Uh, agreement, whether it's we, we don't we don't, most of our people actually don't have patents. You know, because we go to the point where, where if you have an idea, you know, I, I'd say that a lot of times people, how many people on Mayo Clinic Ventures and they say, well, you know, you don't really have any IP around that. And you say, well, this is a significant problem though, right? You know, so, so we do work with what we do is, is, is trusted organizations outside of the institution uh, that have a long-standing, long-standing relationships with Mayo to ensure that, uh, that the IP is completely protected. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the bait shops when, uh, Luke, I have a suggestion. Would you be willing to talk about Y Combinator when we, um, when we do the tabulation? Yeah. So we're going to be tabulating the, the results. Okay. So who, which, who's the chief walleye? Who's going to give us the, you got it right here? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, these three, right? Those three. Okay, so we. I, I, I'm. I'm actually not going to announce the junior, because I'm going to announce after we find us. But our three finalists, as selected by our walleyes, in uh, alpha in uh, presentation order, uh, Oric Sciences. Ambien Clinical Analytics and Micrometer. So, Oric Sciences, Ambien, Ambient, sorry, it's been a long day, <laughs> Clinical Analytics and Micrometer. So, for the audience, you have your 3x5 card. I want you to give us your first, second, and third place. Okay, Enoch. Enoch is ready. Are you ready? Yeah. And pass him. Pass everything, all your index cards, to that side of the auditorium, and Enoch will walk by and grab the cool. yeah. and then you're going to have to Okay. Yep. Yeah. I think Enoch has the hardest job of the whole day. <laughs> I'm from Illinois, so I'll say vote. Vote early and often. I don't know. Did anybody slip Enoch at twenty on the way in? I won't. I I promise. I won't ask. Luke's typing. Getting ready. So I have a question, Luke. Do you like Mark Zuckerberg cover your microphone and your uh, and your uh, video camera? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, you ready? Come on down, Luke. All right, come on down. All right, Luke. Take two, three minutes, just like everybody else. There you go. So my name's Luke. I'm with. Uh, an investment thing called Y Combinator. Specifically, my job there is I'm director of hardware. And I wasn't kidding about what I said at the start, that literally I want non-software things to move as quickly as software. Hardware and certainly biotech have way more potential. They attract way less investment than they should. And they're way more, frankly, I think, interesting than you know another Tinder app. So my not so secret plan is to get a majority of the companies at Y Combinator and a majority of, frankly, all investment flowing <laughs> to things like the companies that all of you are talking about. 
You may have noticed a recurring theme with the question that I asked, which was, when are you going to launch? That's the secret weapon to actually figuring out if anybody cares about the beautiful things you're building. It's not launching this perfect thing that everyone loves the first time. It's launching this horrible, ugly thing. My rule with hardware is as soon as it's not going to catch fire more than half of the time is when you should be getting it in front of users. Maybe have a slightly higher standard with, with biotech things. Like as soon as you're not going to hurt people, basically. As soon as you're going to hurt people less than they're hurting by not using your product, we'll call it. With the animal stuff, I don't know what it is. As soon as the cow won't have two heads, I guess, would be the, would be the standard. But um, I'm not kidding about this. I mean, it's, it is fun because then you're actually showing your thing that you've worked so hard and so long on to real users. It's scary because it's going to be imperfect to you. I mean, my company that went through Y Combinator, the product's in Home Depot now, and it's like cool that it's in Home Depot, but it's also still imperfect. Like, I'll take it apart and change 50 things about it. Your product's never going to be perfect. All of these stories you hear about, you know, the great roads to success of the Googles or the Facebooks or whoever of the world, they're all lies. They're highlight reels, the real story, which if you come to Y Combinator, you'll see these founders speak and they'll give you the off the record honest version and you'll hear about a little bit of the drama and the many failures that occurred along the way. That's the norm. The secret, the secret to launching a product is just to launch a product, to stop waiting, to do it. If any of you want to get into Y Combinator 1, I'd strongly encourage you to apply to email me. It's luke, L-U-K-E, at ycombinator.com. I'll certainly give you honest feedback. Our next set of applications open at the end of August. Our next cohort runs in January. Um, ask Will. He'll give you honest feedback. Talk to any of our other alumni. We funded over 1,200. We're the only incubator, accelerator, whatever, to have unicorns, as in companies that have achieved over a billion dollar funding, and we have over a dozen of them. Um, the most recent was Cruise, a self-driving car company that GM just bought for over a billion, over a billion dollars. So we know, we know what we're talking about, about getting entrepreneurs to simplify and focus on what matters. And that's, that's quite simple. It's make things people want, our motto. So you have to make things. All of you are overdoing it in that category. I'm 100% convinced. And then where you're lacking a bit is maintaining evidence that people actually want what you're making. So put up the hearing app, you know, launch the products, do the minimally regulated route, and you know, pursue, pursue regulatory approval in the meantime if it's relevant for you. I don't know, that seems, seems slow to me. I know it adds some value, but you can certainly launch something, some minimum viable product without. So if you have any questions, please email me after. And I literally want to see everyone in this room starting companies that either apply to YC or just bootstrap their own way to billion dollar plus valuations and world changing results. Thanks. I have a question for you. Do you know what a walleye is? <laughs> Okay, all right, great. Okay, great. Okay, the carp, but better. All right. Okay, while we get the last of the information, I just want to, I want to acknowledge uh, two wonderful, amazing interns, um, Zachary Ware Junkus and Enoch Tan. These two gentlemen made this whole thing work. It was really awesome. Okay. Okay, so we have... We have prizes. Look, no, no, no. We'll pull them out at one at a time. Okay. So for our junior angler, the division winners for our first and hopefully first of many walleye tank events is Go Audio. Come on down. Okay. Come on down. Yeah, you can take a shot at them with it. The, okay. Let me let me describe this. This prize. So this prize is a one of a kind, written uh, lure, and it's a very big lure. The reason it's a big lure is if you want to catch a big walleye, you need a big lure. You don't want to use a little lure because you need a little walleye. So these guys are ready, and I think you did a great job. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Okay, for the for the professional, we have our, our third place prize. So that was, oh yeah, so runner-up. So our runner-up 
this, which is the, it, hold on. I, I don't want to do what happened re earlier this year. Okay. That's first place. That's second place. All right. So second place, our runner-up is Auric Sciences. Okay. So Luke actually had to go. He had a family event. All right, so we will, we will hand it off to him. All right. All right. It is, for your, for your own benefit, that is a cribbage board, a genuine walleye cribbage board for Luke to have on his table and play. Okay. So what's, what's for first place? Who's first? Okay, our first place. And the winner of the 2016 walleye tank competition Come on over, I'm gonna show it to you. This is a 3D Aww. metal walleye. <laughs> is micrometer, come on out. Congratulations, that was great. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you gotta pose for the picture. Awesome. Awesome. All right, here's shot. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 awesome, thanks everybody. Okay, so on the chart we have um, one thing. There is a, we have reservations. This is a community building event at Cafe Steam. Encourage all of you or any that are interested to um, participate in, our, in a post-event watering hole. Um, I just had one last piece. I just want to, I want to thank the walleyes. Thank you very much. Please everybody, thank you for their time. I just, the last bit is, this was an experiment. This whole event was an experiment. It got built um, as we go. And I, I, and I would love to get anybody's feedback for opportunities to improve, expand, uh, and grow. I know we will be growing for the next event with the University of Minnesota with Allison Hubble. That's already, the deal's already been inked. And I know the Florida group is interested um, uh, has expressed interest in continuing. So um, I want to thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, and go out and uh, make the world a better place. Thank you.